again, welcome to our annual Groundhog Day webinar. Um, I just want to thank everyone who's here in attendance today. We really appreciate your continued support year after year. Uh, this year's webinar, similar to Groundhog Phil's prediction, is six more weeks of discovery. Security continues to change, review endures. And uh, let's introduce our presenters today. Uh, um, unfortunately, uh, Jeff Hudson had something come up last minute uh, and he will not be able to make it. However, Acorn CEO, Leah Mahid will be taking us through this presentation. Um, a little background on Leah. She founded Acorn Legal Solutions with the idea of bringing rigorous progress man project management to e-discovery. Similar to those used from her experience in the aerospace industry, uh, Leah also holds an MBA from Kellogg University, as well as an electrical engineering and mathematics degree from Case Western Reserve University. Essentially, she's pretty smart. <laughs> Um, and at this time, uh, I'm just going to turn it over to Leah so we can get started. Yeah, I apologize. You guys are going to have to hear my voice for the whole webinar with no breaks, but I'll try to keep it interesting. I'm going to start off by telling you a little bit about the current landscape and why we settled on the agenda that we settled on. Um, every quarter, eDiscovery today does a, an annual survey, and they, they ask a number of questions, but the question I want to highlight is, you know, they list out six items and they ask e-discovery professionals what they think will impact e-discovery business the most over the next six months. And these are, these are people that range from law firms to corporations to service providers. And as you can see, the blue bar here is the answer budgets. And what happened in March of 2020 when COVID hit us is that budgets suddenly came to the forefront. And so budgets and e-discovery are the driving factor in every decision and what everybody is thinking about from top to bottom, left to right, all through all through the industry. We're seeing that wane a little bit because, you know, as COVID is starting to feel like it's going to get under control and as we know how to operate in a COVID world, you know, the pressure is releasing a little bit there. But still, as of the latest survey, that that blue bar is higher than it's ever been. And when I think of budgets, um, what I think of is you know, the hurdle that we've always had in e-discovery and the hurdle that remains at the forefront with the survey is, it's not just that e-discovery is expensive, which it can be, it's also that e-discovery budgets feel very unmanageable in that people don't know what the total cost of review is go going to be. They don't know whether they're getting a good deal or not, and they don't know whether they're getting value for their money or not. And so I think all of those features combine to make budgets and e-discovery a real discussion point in 2021 and perhaps going forward. And so part of what we're dedicating our webinar today to is that issue. The second thing that really strikes me about this survey is data security. Now, data security in e-discovery has always been a topic. You can see that orange bar isn't really moving that much. But when you look at this orange bar more recently relative to the white bar, even though it feels like data security has just returned to what it's always been at, which is around 12 to 13% of respondents think it's going to be important. It actually is pretty remarkable that it's staying at 13%, even with budgets eating up so much of, of, of the survey results. And so this 13% is actually much higher, much stronger interest in data security than I think we've seen previously in the e-discovery industry. Um, that's driven by a lot of factors, including regulations, including businesses shifting to remote workforces and IT having more exposure to their executive suite. But data security and budgets are going to be the big focus of the 20, 2021. And so they're a big focus of our webinar. Um, interestingly, alternative data sources seems to be dropping off in interest. So this is the same survey with just, you know, people who said that they were concerned about the increasing types of data pulled out. And you can see that really dropped when COVID hit. Again, everybody was concerned about budgets, but you can see that this number is staying pretty depressed. Um, and so this to me represents a big shift because prior to COVID and prior to 2020 and 2021, it seemed like everybody was always talking about increasing data sources, increasing data volumes. I think we're seeing a shift towards a concern, concern for data security and concern for controlling budgets. Um, 
I, I personally, I love this little joke. Who led the digital transformation at your company, CEO, CTO, or COVID-19? So I think the reason we're seeing a drop off in alternative data sources is now that everybody has been forced to reckon with it, there's the expectation that they'll deal with it. And that's reflected in the survey results too. Like two thirds of um, the respondents to the survey thought that organizations are going to address alternative data source related issues in 2021. So it's not that this is not going to be um, on people's agendas. It's just that the expectation is that businesses are going to take care of this themselves and is it not going to impact uh, e-discovery service providers and our relationships with our clients that much. So with that, our agenda, we're talking about data security. We're going to touch briefly on remote review only because remote review relates to both data security and total cost of review. We have an entire section on total cost of review, which we put a lot of work and thought into and I'm excited to share with you. And then we're gonna wrap this up with some key takeaways. If you have questions, we've got the Q&A button at the bottom of the Zoom meeting. Feel free to type those in and we'll try to answer them live if we see them. And if not, we've got five minutes set aside, 10 minutes set aside at the end of the, the webinar today. So this might take somewhere between 30 and 40 minutes to get through an entirety. And we're happy to stay on as long as people have questions after that. Data security. So. There are a number of factors driving the need to update and change data security policies and procedures. The first is, um, you know, people have changed the way that they've worked. And so with that, there's new sources. With that, there's more digital evidence than there's ever been before, right? So stuff that used to be said out loud in conferences or in offices are now being captured um, in digital, digital data. And so all of that needs to be maintained and managed. There's more dark and unstructured data. Um, there's more remote access. So there's more data being stored on employees' personal computers or maybe their personal phones than there has been previously. And there's more sensitive and private data that needs to be managed. And so all of this is requiring a second look at data privacy and data security policies because it's a change in how operations are primarily working. Um, we are seeing to, to our client's credit and to the industry's credit, we are seeing most people are being proactive with procedures and protocols rather than reactive. But this is something that you know continues to stay top of mind and continues to drive um, conversations that we're having around data security operations. The second change is data privacy regulations are growing in popularity and they're starting to get more teeth. And that's changing both data privacy policies, but as a result of changing those data privacy policies, it's changing the data security policies. So for the longest time, everybody was talking about GDPR. That certainly is the most comprehensive data privacy uh, uh, regulation in the world. And it is a, a model for a lot of other states and entities. Um, it, it creates fines that have teeth. So if, if companies don't comply with data privacy or data security obligations, they get fined. And so what we've seen is California has come out with CCPA, which is based in part on GDPR. And that happened about a year ago. And then in this past uh, November 2020 election, they actually expanded the regulations around data privacy with the introduction of the CPRA, um, which is the California Public Records Act, which is related to CCPA. And so all of this is just creating more rigor and more structure around data privacy and laws, which are driving data security requirements. And these are viewed generally as indicators that we can probably expect more comprehensive data privacy reform in the US at a federal level. That might be more states uh, mimicking what California is doing. That might be the federal government adopting some variation of California's laws or the GDPR, some sort of mix and match, match, mix and match solution. But the expectation is that this, this trend is going to continue. And then the final factor is that data breaches are becoming larger and more sophisticated. And so all of this is changing data security policies and data security procedures. I think the most famous example of this is our, our recent solar winds, the recent solar winds breach that, that got a lot of publicity, right? That was a leading software where the software itself is supposed to be monitoring for breaches. Um, and it was used by Fortune 500s and government entities. And what happened there is hackers opened a door to the environment that went undiscovered for about six months. And the problem with that is, you know, since that door has been open for so long, um, it's very hard to know if any hackers have walked through that door and installed other doors on a network. And so it's going to take a very long time for 
um, the networks that were compromised to know whether they have a certificate of good health because it's not enough to just close the, the original door that was open in the breach. They, they have to look for new doors and see if those are also open. And so normally what you would do in a situation like this is you would basically shut down your system, you would rewind to before the breach happened and you would restore your entire infrastructure to the safe environment, the pre-breach environment. And you might lose some data, you might lose some progress, but you would expect that that is an acceptable loss um, to be sure that you have a secure environment. But with the SolarWinds breach, because it existed for so long, that's not really a feasible solution. So we learned a lot from SolarWinds breach, some of which is that SolarWinds was not adhering to good data security policies and procedures. But also what we learned from it is that SolarWinds customers were essentially doing everything right. They were investing in technology. They often had very good policies and procedures, and they were inadvertently affected by SolarWinds own mismanagement of their security procedures. And so we can no longer operate in a world where we think data breaches don't happen or where we think we can avoid them. We have to operate in a world where we assume that they will happen. And so that's become a real shift in the thinking of um, security professionals in the industry over the past year and going into future years. So how this has helped our thinking evolve at ACORN and what we wanted to share with you is we think of security policy along five pillars and I'm sure there's other frameworks and I'm sure there's other ways to think about this. Um, this is just our own internal homegrown approach to this. And so we think, you know, there's three pillars that are on the breach prevention and identification side. And there's two pillars on the breach mitigation side. And so, you know, the lowest hanging fruit is gonna be on breach prevention and identification. And there's a lot of work that a lot of organizations can do there. Um, you know, the software is, is one pillar. We wanna make sure that the software that we're using is secure, it's not hackable, it's patched regularly, and that the vendors we're purchasing from have very good um, behaviors and habits around how they test their software and make sure there's no vulnerabilities. Um, in addition, we use software, like having software that's actively monitoring for breaches and identifications or any data exfiltration is an important part to any comprehensive policy. Um, there's the infrastructure pillar and that's things like making sure the infrastructure can't be accessed by computers that are not part of the network or making sure that there's physical safeguards in place with the infrastructure that prevent somebody from physically going to your infrastructure and plugging in a USB drive or something like that. Um, to be fair, in the industry, most people over the past couple of years have been pretty sophisticated about both, both of these pillars. It's very common for people to be thinking smart and intelligently about this. The third pillar, where there's a lot of, this is the lowest hanging fruit, um, there's been a lot more discussion around this lately, has been educating people. So making sure that your employees or your contractors or whomever you're using, the, the security guard at the data center that you're using, making sure that all of those points of people have been adequately trained to prevent phishing and to, um, to identify phishing, report it, prevent themselves from clicking on the links, and also to um, not download malware on their computer. The speculation that I've read is that part of the SolarWinds breach was that an employee's computer was compromised and then that allowed the hackers to reset somebody's password. So people, um, People education is a very important part of breach prevention and also identification. So if somebody is trained on what to do when they see an irregularity and, and they're, they're empowered to report it. That's a very important pillar of uh, data security policies. And then on the breach mitigation side, this is the, we don't know when a breach is going to happen, but we are reasonably confident that it will happen at some point in our future approach to the world that we're starting to take now. Um, we really look at two things and the first thing is backups, right? Because so much of handling a breach is being able to shut it down when it's in the process and rewind to a period before the breach occurred, having really robust backups that are stored separately from the environment that have some sort of good regularity with how, how, how routinely they're backed up and how long they're kept, um, having a lot of, of thought and processes in place around all of that, the disaster recovery and business continuity is a very important pillar for uh, your data security programs. And to be honest, this seems like one that is just becoming top of mind for a lot of people in sort of recent history. 
Um, and then incident response is also very important. So a lot of clarity around how incidents are tracked and a lot of transparency. You know, the, the, the SolarWinds breach ultimately got broken by another company reporting it to the market. And if that hadn't happened, that breach could have continued for who knows how long. And so incidents response and transparency around a security issue and make sure there's good policies around that are a really important pillar to a solid uh, data security policy. Um, oftentimes, even if you have all good policies around all those pillars where security programs often fail is in their adherence to those policies. And so um, when you are looking at vendors and your own internal data security policies, you should also be thinking about how do you vet that you're getting adherence to those policies at the organizational level, at the vendor level, at the individual letter level. Um, typically, what is becoming much more common in the industry is for an audited report from an independent third party. So we're, for example, SOC 2 audited, and so that's we hire ex in much in the same way an accounting audit works. We hire external experts. They come in, they ask questions, they ask for proof that we're doing what we're doing. Um, and then they'll write a report and certify that. And we can send that to our clients so that our clients don't need to rely on our own reporting, but they have some independent reporting. That's the gold standard of ensuring that your vendors are adhering to these data security policies. But what a lot of, um, a lot of companies, a lot of law firms do that don't maybe they don't have um, vendors with SOC 2 reports is they'll come up with their own vendor security checklist. And to the market's credit, a lot of these are pretty good. Uh, the things to make sure that, that, that are on your list that sometimes we don't see always included is make sure there's questions around training and education programs and proof that those training and education programs are happening. Um, ask for penetration test results, not just the policy that they get, penetration tests routinely on their network, but what the results of those tests were and what the report was. Um, look for data loss prevention policies, software procedures, and any reports that might be around those. Even a sample report will tell you a lot about whether it's something the organization takes seriously. Um, look to make sure that multi-factor authentication is enabled. The easiest way on that people pillar, the easiest way to avoid most problems is even if an account gets fished, if you have multi-factor authentication, that can really reduce the amount of damage. And so that's very low hanging fruit that, that most organizations want to see widely deployed. And then ask for disaster recovery. In particular, ask for the last time that your vendor or your team ran a disaster recovery scenario. And so um, make sure those five things are on your vendor security checklist, and you'll probably have most of your bases covered. When we look in the industry, I mean, Acorn has been on this journey over the past year, of really focusing on security in light of COVID and in light of the changes in the market. And so um, when we look at the industry, we think relativity one is the gold standard in terms of what security you should be looking for from an e-discovery vendor, right? They've got um, excellent features and excellent policies. And this is just a small, a small list of a very comprehensive list of features they have, but these are some I wanted to highlight. So the first is they rely very heavily on certifications. So they're certified, they have their SOC 2 audit, they're certified with ISO, they're HIPAA certified, they're in the process of getting FedRAMP certified. And so all of these are suggesting that their security solutions are so robust that they meet a myriad of certification platforms. That is certainly one level of comfort. Um, they have encryption everywhere. And so what they do is if your data is stored on a hard drive or if your data is being transferred, it's encrypted. And so even if a breach occurs, essentially the hackers might see the encrypted data, but they won't necessarily be able to get to the private information or the sensitive in information behind that data. And so it's just another layer of protection. Um, Relativity One, I think, is exceptional with their 24-7 transparent monitoring. So they keep logs of every incident, every investigation they've done, and they will share that with you if you ask them to, of course, under NDA. And so that level of security and transparency gives a lot of comfort that, that their data security program is in really good shape. They have like really extensive backups and they have layers of authentication. You can authenticate multiple, multiple ways with them. You can do two-factor. You can do same ID. They just have a lot of options on that front. And so it's things that give a lot of comfort. And so we've moved our operations. We are in the process of moving our operations to Relativity One. We'll be fully on Relativity One 
before the end of the year, definitely, and likely before the summer. Um, but these are examples of what you want to look for in a vendor and in a uh, e-discovery provider to make sure that your data security is up to the standard that's expected in a post-COVID world. Um, we've talked a lot about data security postures and considerations generally in running maybe an e-discovery program or maybe even more broadly any information governance program. When we start looking at specific pieces of litigation, um, you might also consider requesting the same data security obligations from opposing that you typically would request of your vendor. So currently we don't see very many ESI protocols that speak to much of anything about data security. Um, at best, we might say something like, you know, some sort of reasonable accommodation for a secure environment, but it won't specify what that is. And over the past year, I think we're seeing there's a lot of divergent views and there's a lot of different opinions about what a secure environment is. And it varies a lot depending on the type of data, depending on where the company, where the company is operating. Um, and so, it, there's no sort of black and white answer to this. And so what we're hearing from um, across the sort of different trade associations and from a lesser extent to the from the bench is that there is an openness to start including data security riders on ESI agreements and ESI protocols. And so this is always a tough one because it's always hard to tell the other side how to how to do what they're supposed to be doing. But this could be an area where there's more sympathy from the bench. And if you have sensitive or confidential data, um, you might assert your, your right to protect that data. Um, and also, in cases where you might be facing asymmetrical litigation, um, a more secure e-discovery environment could potentially drive up costs for opposing, depending on how they're currently storing that data. And so it might create some incentives for opposing to um, collaborate uh, to reduce the scope of discovery. And so there's some potential for win-wins there as well. Uh, lastly, when we look at specific litigation, um, there's security considerations with remote reviewers. So 2020, and this has been discussed um, loads of times, and I'm, I, I suspect I'm not the best authority on this. I suspect there's many other webinars or papers that address this better, but 2020, was the year of the remote reviewer, right? You couldn't have these um, big offices with 100 reviewers, you know, logging into a computer with somebody looking over their shoulder because of COVID restrictions. And so with that came less physical access control. You couldn't monitor what the contract reviewers are doing. They're likely looking at documents on private devices. You know, there's a sense that there's less comfort with, um, with the notion that you know they're not taking pictures of what they're reviewing or screenshots or downloading files or anything like that. Um, and then there's also the sort of all the additional considerations of them being not remote employees, but like remote employees having phishing and malware issues as well. And so um, in, in litigation specific security, you should consider like what the training and what the obligations are gonna be on the remote reviewers. You know, you might have a preference if you have something with a lot of data security considerations or data privacy considerations, you might have a preference for hiring licensed attorneys as your contract reviewers, um, since it comes with the ethical obligations to you know, protect the data and keep it confidential and all of that. And so that's one thing to keep in mind with data security policies. So with that, we're gonna turn over and start discussing our total cost of review section. So when we, started thinking about this, this uh, content. And we, we knew we wanted to talk about total cost of review since budgets are so important to the market. We spent a lot of time trying to think about what the best way to do that would be. And what we settled on is that we would come up with a standard workflow case. And that is pretty routine, pretty much what you would see across the industry. And then we'll start to discuss um, taking that standard case and comparing it against different workflows or different scenarios. And so with that, we'll start to get more of a real world discussion around how decisions get made and how TCR can be managed and understood. Um, this is entirely an economic discussion. So we're not getting into you know, the legal arguments for increasing or reducing the scope, scope of discovery so much. This is entire, intended to be um, entirely focused on the economics. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna take that standard workflow and we're gonna have three scenarios. We're gonna compare it to um, how does the standard workflow versus a narrow, narrower scope of collection impact TCR? 
how does the standard workflow versus some investments and expertise regarding early case assessment or early data assessment affect TCR? And then how does the standard workflow versus investments and expertise around AI or technology assisted review affect the total cost of review? And so what we settled on for our standard workflow, coming back to the good old EDRM, is first, you know, in month one, we're going to do the collection. We picked prices that are generally in the direction of close to market, but also nice round numbers. Again, with the aim of this being more an illustra illustrative exercise than a, you know, a concrete economic analysis. Um, but it is very grounded in reality. The numbers we're showing you are very realistic. So in month one, we're going to collect the custodians. We would typically see something in the ballpark of $500 per device for that. In month two, that data is going to be processed, deduped, and filtered. And so we're saying the price on that is $35 a gig and the call rate is 80%, which is typically seen. Um, month three is when we're going to start hosting the data. And rather than getting into the nuance of how many users are there, how much data is being hosted, how much tech time is being used, we're just using a $25 per gigabyte per month rate, which is more reflective of some of the bundled rates and is directionally pretty correct to where the unbundled rates tend to end up. And then finally, in month four, we're going to do the review and production. And so we're using the assumption that that costs a dollar per document reviewed, which again is pretty close to what actually ends up being market for this type of work. And so with that, I'm going to pose a question to the audience and Luke is going to kick off a poll for you. So during the initial collections, would you rather collect four custodians or six custodians? So your lawyers of your outside counsel has told you, I, um, there's a gray area, could be four custodians, could be six custodians. Four custodians are gonna cost you $2,000. Six custodians are gonna cost you $3,000. Should you keep it narrow and keep it cheap or just spend the extra $1,000? be safe and not have to deal with a headache down the line. So um, you should have a poll on your screen. Luke, are you gonna let me know when this poll is closed and when we have some results? Uh, yeah, uh, give me one more second. Yeah. All right, so overwhelmingly, Interestingly, overwhelmingly, everybody said broad. Completely understandable. Most vendors will tell you broad too because they make an extra thousand dollars that way. Um, there's arguments for both, but let's look at what the economics say. So again, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna lay out for you on this first scenario, I'm gonna go slowly through the charts and lay out for you how to read them and then we'll go a little bit faster in the next charts. So again, in month one, you've got your targeted collection and the standard workflow. And the standard workflow is the six custodians, the targeted collection is four. It's $2,000 versus $3,000. They're basically even. What happens in month two is that targeted collection gets processed and deduped. And so you see this big red box tick up. Um, in month three, that then goes into hosting. And so you see this little fee. And the way to read these charts is, is this is not what you're being charged in month two or three. This is the cumulative expense you've had. So this month three number includes the month two number, includes the month one number. And then finally, in month four, you do your review. And so what happens when you compare this to the standard? Well, you start out with this very small difference, but then you have 50% more to process. And so your processing is 50% higher. And then you have 50% more to host. And so your hosting is higher and that gets compounded every month. So that 50% higher this month is also 50% higher next month is also 50% higher the month after that. And then you get your total cost of review because you have more custodians, you have more documents to review. And because you have more documents to review and the most expensive thing you can do is review documents, you end up with this huge total cost of review under the seemingly small decision to collect more data than you do under the narrower decision. So in this case, it's about a $25,000 difference or about a 33% discount to go narrower versus broader. So what's the takeaway from this? In total cost of review, the biggest cost is actually putting eyeballs on the documents. Anything that reduces that saves money. 
So economically small decisions translate into big differences in budget. And this is really counterintuitive. And I like this example because, you know, very small decisions you make at the outset of the project have huge impacts on the total, total budget at the end of the project. Now, I understand that there's probably a lot of reasons to still collect broadly. So first, if you're concerned that getting all your custodians coordinating, coordinated and getting the collection done is going to be a lot of work, it might make sense to do it in one shot. If you're concerned about preservation or spoliation concerns, then it might also make sense to do it in one shot. And if you have the ability to collect six custodians, but only process and review four custodians, that's a bit like having your cake and eating it too. And it's a best of both worlds approach. And so there are still, I'm not saying there aren't reasons to collect six custodians instead of four. What I'm saying is that it's really astounding how a small dollar amount decision at the beginning can turn into a huge dollar amount decision at the end of, of the process. And so when we start talking about budgets and how that's creating a lot of pressure in the e-discovery market, and more importantly, generally, when you have to defend those budgets to people who are outside the industry, why they don't understand where the money is going, this is the type of stuff that's important to articulate to them so that they can understand the process. So let me see what our next scenario is. All right, so we're gonna do this exercise two more times. Our next scenario is for the custodians you collected. So again, we're gonna go with the six custodians. We're gonna call that the standard workflow. For the custodians you collected, would you be willing to spend $5,000 upfront to increase the call rate from 80% to 85%? And so Luke's gonna kick this off with a poll and we're gonna give you guys a couple minutes to think about it. Oh, I'm starting to convince you guys. We have two for spend the money and three for don't spend the money or 40%, sorry, I'm reading that chart wrong. 40% for, for spend the money and 60% for don't spend the money. Um, yeah, $5,000 seems like a lot when the total project is like 50,000, right? That's 10% 10, 10 of the budget um, for what doesn't seem like a big change, right? You were, you're already most of the way there. Why are you going for another 5%? Um, Let's look at what the numbers say. So here we have, you know, the collection, you're collecting the same amount of documents. The processing, you're processing the same amount of documents, you've got the same fees. In month three, you're spending this extra money on this early case assessment or early data assessment. And then you're, you're sort of putting that data into hosting. And so even though these numbers, these two purple bars look like they're the same size, I assure you they're actually different. So when you spend the money and you increase the call rate, your hosting number is a little lower. You're spending about $1,100 a month instead of $1,500 a month. And at this point, you're probably feeling pretty good about yourself if you decided not to spend the $5,000 because you're saying to yourself, it's gonna take me like a year and a half to recover that $5,000 by not spending $400 a month, month at a, one month at a time. But when you start thinking about this in terms of what does this mean in terms of the number of documents that you're looking at, the impact actually gets very exaggerated. And so even though you've spent that additional $5,000 in month three, you're actually saving $11,000 over the life of the review. Um, and that's coming from two things. It's coming from one, your hosting costs are a little bit low and it's not a, a meaningful difference, but it does compound over the life of the case. And two, um, your biggest expense by far is the number of documents that are being reviewed. And so, you know, if, if $5,000 saves you 5,000 documents from being reviewed, then that $5,000 has paid for itself. If that $5,000 saves you more than 5,000 documents from being reviewed, then that $5,000 has more than paid for itself. And so we see this a lot 
And actually where we see this, and this is really amazing, where we see this is, is we tell clients that we think they should invest $5,000 to make the call rate go from 80% to something like 80.2%. And even at numbers that small, depending on how much data you have in, in, in your um, litigation, that 0.2% can pay for itself very quickly because reviewing documents is extremely expensive. So again, the takeaway here is that the biggest driver of the total cost of review is the total reviewable document set. Almost always investments in tools and expertise that reduce the document set for review return value. It's, I'm sure I could come up with some examples where they don't, but it's probably like a 99% chance that it will work in your favor. Um, things that might, even though, again, even though the economics are saying that in the long run, paying for that expertise is gonna reduce the total cost of review, things that might make you think about not spending that $5,000 that are completely reasonable are things like, if you don't expect the litigation to actually progress to the stage where you're paying reviewers, then you might not want to spend that $5,000 because that $5,000 is a, an investment in the long run, long term return. And you're, you're in a short term game. And so that $5,000, if you're going to settle at the end of month three before you get into review, that's just an extra $5,000 out of your pocket. Um, sometimes, if you have really tight production timeframes, you're not going to want to spend the extra $5,000 on the consulting engagement because you're not going to want to introduce more uncertainty and more delay into the process. So you'll take the penalty of the $5,000 or the $11,000 um, because at least you know you're going to produce on time and with a lot of certainty. And so it, it's, it, it can be viewed, that $11,000 could be view, viewed as the cost of an insurance policy. And I'm sure there's other examples that you guys can come up with too. Um, but those are some things to think about. Again, total cost of review is very, when you start understanding e-discovery in those terms, you start to see how very small decisions at the front end of the process compound into huge economic changes once the project is completely done. All right, last question for you. Would you spend $3,000 on analytics expertise upfront to use active learning technology to create a responsive, non-responsive model for you? So there's no other hosting fees, there's no other technology fees, you basically have to pay for an expert to help you think through how you're going to set it up, and then to execute it with the software on the back end. I see the surveys up, so we'll give people a, a chance to, to answer. <laughs> I still got a hold out, a few holdouts. So here we have 80% of the people saying spend the money and 20% of the people saying don't spend the money. <laughs> well, I'm glad to see movement in the right direction. So this very much like the last situation, um, the first month and the second month are the same because we're talking about something that's happening a little later in the process. In this scenario, once again, you have this expertise that you're spending money on in month three versus the standard workflow, you're not. This time, actually, you're not saving any money on hosting. I didn't put the numbers in, but um, because the analytics expertise isn't actually reducing the documents that are going into your hosting environment, they're just being used on the documents that you're putting into your hosting environment either way, you don't actually start getting returns from, from, from hosting on a monthly basis. And so if your standard workflow ends up costing you about $77,000. What does the active learning workflow cost you? This becomes a tough question to answer, actually, because active learning is used a few different ways. So one way, you take all the documents that you were gonna look at, you split them into the documents you care about, which are the ones with the thumbs up, you split them into the ones you don't, which are the thumbs down, and you still have a reviewer review every document. Um, this is, probably the safest, safest way to use our active learning. It's the least economically efficient, but you get benefits from this because you're still gonna find the documents that you care about faster because you're using the model than if you had tried to do it without the model. Because you've got the model naturally working in the ba background to push the cream to the top. 
The second way you can use active learning is you've got that pile of documents and the stuff you care about and the stuff you don't. And you put enough eyes on the stuff you don't care about to train the model, but you spend all your time looking at the stuff you care about. And then this portion of, of stuff you don't care about that you're reasonably confident the model is accurate predicting, you never look at it. It might be things like mass emails, it might be things like fantasy football emails, it might be other junk that the model is helping to sort out for you. And then the last way that you can use active learning is you look at just enough documents to train the model and then you trust the model. And in God I trust for everything else there's data, right? That, that's, that's what the model would tell you. Um, and so depending on which one of these workflows you use, uh, that would affect what that fourth months economics look like. That said, at ACORN, we almost always recommend this sort of second approach. We certainly can work with, with whatever clients want, but for commercial reasons, we typically see the second approach makes the most sense. And so we built out our bar chart here using the second approach. And so what you can end up with, um, with active learning, is you can actually end up spending more than you would with the standard model. Um, or you could end up sp spending substantially less. The expected value, I would say, on an active learning project that's been conceptualized as active learning from the beginning would be about a reduction of $20,000 or about a reduction of you know, 30 to 35% because active learning does a really good job of getting rid of, the, the, of separating the wheat from the chaff. And so you still need eyeballs on the stuff that matters to you, but active learning can be a tool to avoid having to put eyeballs on the stuff that doesn't matter to you. So again, um, generally active learning is a good investment even without reducing the document set. And that's because it's pretty inexpensive to implement. And even in cases where you don't save money, you'd gain time, which is in and of itself its own form of value. So what happens when you put it all together? So if we um, narrow our target set spend the money to, to call the data better and use active learning, what's the net impact of that in economic terms? Well, first of all, there's diminishing returns because everything you do has like a really big impact if it's the only thing you do, but a lesser contribution if you're doing multiple things, right? And so what you do is you start out in month one and you have less custodians and what we're calling the perfect workflow. There's no such thing as perfect workflow, but for the purposes of this analysis, it's catchy. Um, you have less collections with the perfect workflow versus the standard. Your processing number is less in the perfect workflow versus the standard, but you incur this extra consulting fee from the ECA analysis. Your hosting is a little less in this perfect workflow, but you incur the extra fee from the active learning consulting. And then your document review is drastically less versus the, the standard workflow. And so putting all these together, you can reduce your total cost of review by over half. So in this example, it would have reduced it by $34,000. Um, and this is something we see in practice. Uh, everybody's always talking about the broiler chicken litigation. And that's because the broiler chicken litigation is doing a lot of this stuff. And they were facing such extreme expenses that they were forced to consider this, but they've become very good models for how we can apply a lot of these tools and techniques and strategies, even on mid-sized and more routine cases to have reduced total cost of review. And so my, my message to the audience is that strategic workflows can provide a significant amount of budget efficiency beyond just line item reviews, uh, reductions. So Certainly, if you want to reduce total cost of review and you can get down to 90 cents per document reviewed instead of a dollar per document reviewed, that's going to reduce your total cost of review, certainly. But that lemon has been squeezed. That lemon has being sque been squeezed for the past five years and there's not a lot of juice left in it. For the most part, the industry has gotten about as low as it can get on almost all of the line items. Where there's room to continue reducing TCR and where there's lemon, lemon juice left to get is in thinking about these more strategic workflows. And so as we think about e-discovery in 2021, the key takeaways are now is the time to evaluate your vendor security policies and their adherence to those policies. General data security policies can also extend to case specific litigation strategies and think about ways to reduce the total cost of review. We've identified three easy ones 
you don't need to be perfect. If you start implementing any one of these, you're going to start seeing pretty significant results pretty quickly. And so um, with that, I'll turn it over to questions and answers. All right, well, we are past our time. So if you are interested in um, seeing some of these tools in action, talking to some of our team members about these topics generally or specific to any litigation, we do CLEs, we do workshops, we'll do side-by-side -side trainings uh, specific to your law firm or organization. So feel free to contact us at CLE at acornls.com. So thanks for your time, everyone.